Welcome to Plant Your Seed. I'm your host, Fred Ferris. On each episode, we share stories of how ordinary people have transformed their lives. Each story is compassionate, each story is authentic, and each story is a transformation. Here are the stories of the people who are changing our world by transitioning to a plant-based diet. Today on Plant Your Seed, joining us from Canada, we have Margot Corey. Margot is a founder of Vegan Businesses, a corporate advisor for ethical startups, and a speaker on animal rights, animal agriculture, environmental issues, and ethics. Welcome, Margo. Hi, Fred. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks for being here on Plant Your Seed. Let's start with your vegan journey. How and when did you transition to a plant-based diet? I made the switch about 12 years ago now. Um, thinking back to that history, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. Mind Actually, what's crazy is that I wasn't vegan before that. Um, but I watched a documentary done by a, a friend uh, called Earthlings. Mm. And so for me, it did start with ethical reasons uh, for the animals. And then, of course, I found out about the amazing health benefits after that. So it's, uh, yeah, that's how I transitioned. Can you take us back to that day you're watching Earthlings? What were you thinking and how did you feel? Oh, man. Yeah, it's... Uh, it, I, I haven't seen it since only clips because I mean, I, I do watch, um, we go undercover, you know, I watch, uh, horrible things happening to animals, but I do remember how I was feeling because I remember thinking, how can humans do this? Mm. How can we, you know, how, how is it even possible? Uh, I also come, I have a lot of farmers in my family, so it made me, um, not angry at them, but angry a little bit at the system and how mm. it's we've been conditioned to believe that this is the right way to be and live. What was it about Earthlings that made such an impact on you? Um, there was no way I could keep doing something that I knew was a massive injustice. Uh, and to me, there's no gray line with justice. It's either you're on the on the you know right side or the wrong side, and so. Uh, I lo I had also uh, companion animals. We had rescue dogs. Um, I res we rescue a lot of animals, and I wasn't living in alignment with my values. If I'm going to continue paying for something that comes from abuse and um, violence, and continue pretending that I loved animals, and I always say you don't have to love animals to know that it's wrong what we're doing to them. What positive changes did you see both physically and mentally when you changed to a plant-based diet? At first, um, to be completely honest, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't the easiest switch back then, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, didn't really know we were one of, you know, just like a lot of people listening, probably, um, both my partner and I both, uh, ate a lot of animals and we came from families that if you didn't have an animal product on your plate, it wasn't considered a full meal. And so, um, so the change was difficult at first and I didn't see many changes. I did it for the animals, um, at first, but then I discovered the whole foods, you know, the, the, the fact that a ve vegan isn't this new age thing that we need, like, you know, alternative products or things like that to incorporate into our, life, um, even though tofurkey is amazing, it's a good for transitioning or something, mm. but that's all we had. I felt I couldn't find anything else in Eastern Canada other than something like a tofurkey. Um, but I discovered that, you know, if we wanted to feel physically and mentally well and actually thrive, um, what I later, uh, studied what, with the lot, what the longest living humans, healthiest and longest living humans have in common, they thrive on whole food plant-based. And then I started doing like raw, uh, like cleanses and raw. And that is when I saw so many amazing changes because I literally cleansed my, my body, my gut. Um, I, there was, you know, years and years of abuse to our system affects how we absorb nutrients. And this is what's very important for people to understand is that if we're making the transition, it is important to look at how we're going to, uh, help our bodies heal, and then incorporate the whole foods in. Now, do you recommend cleansing your body or fasting? Or wh what do you feel um, is the best way to reset your gut microbiome? 
Yeah. Now I'm really careful here because there are a lot of fads out there. There are a lot of like, cleanses and things people pay like, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars for. And I don't feel that's actually necessary. I feel, I feel it can be as simple as, um, incorporating a, a, like, first of all, yes, uh, fast is a beautiful way. Like if you're even drinking, um, water or lemon water till noon for a week straight, um, and then raw, like raw is an amazing way to cleanse because you're getting the fiber and it's like flushing our system out. Juicing is amazing, meaning uh, actually pressing our own juice, mm -hmm. not just buying juice from the store. But I will mention something that I did discover years ago throughout my journey is something called hydrocolonic therapy. And I'm not sure if you've heard of that, Fred, or not, but it's basically like a colon cleanse. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of practitioners, like all over California, for sure. You know, Massachusetts would have a, a lot of practitioners. I was lucky to have one here in Eastern Canada. She was trained in Poland. Anyway, she, it's, it's a beautiful, if you look up hydrocolonics, mm -hmm. um, it, fl it, it flushes the entire colon and things come out that, that, you know, need to come out. And then I call that a clean slate. It's like a fresh canvas for a painter. Um, and then once that happens, you can start from scratch and then incorporate the healing, eat like lots of fermented food, um, amazing for the gut microbiome. So there's a whole, there's actually a whole cleanse I do take people on, um, for my few clients that I still have. I don't do that full time anymore, but but it's a, a beautiful thing to watch um, because our everything improves. You know, you asked about the changes. It's like skin improves, hair improves, um, mentally uh, less fog, <laughs> like, mm. better focus. Like I just, it's it's quite amazing when done properly. Um, and unfortunately, and fortunately, this information is getting out. But, but unfortunately, we have to do that because the way we have been eating has been a mistake. Right. You know, a big mistake. You mentioned struggling. What did you struggle most when you became plant-based? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, well, literally dairy, by the way, like dairy was a big thing for me because for, for everybody, most of the time they say dairy was difficult, but in terms of like, how, like, you know, traveling, for example, uh, whenever we traveled at the time, it was quite difficult to find anything in a restaurant that isn't like um, just a salad or something very plain or French mm -hmm. fries, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> things like that. As a parent, my children, I mean, I had, I am very, I feel so fortunate to have found this before my first, having my first child because we discovered it. I dove into the research, contacted some people I know, some awesome experts I was lucky enough to have in my life and decided to have a vegan pregnancy, my very first one. And so I, I did that, even though we definitely were shunned by a lot of medical professionals um, and then had my children who were uh, vegan since birth. And that was a struggle as they, it still is, you know, I know you and I talked a little bit about this before uh, we started recording, but that has been, and always, ca it can be a struggle uh, for parents, but the the good thing and, and the wonderful, um, amazing way I have found is that if we, if we help our children see the ethical side of why we're doing this, age appropriately, but they can handle quite a bit. They love animals. If we can see that, then it's not a, in terms of how our children make choices, that's not a struggle at all anymore because my children, for example, do make the, the plant-based choice based on their, their uh, love for animals and their ethics. So eating out and going to parties and things like that, it's mind blowing, but my five-year-old will not touch um, ice cream or a cake if it has, he calls it, if it has an animal in it or if it has dairy in it. But I do make sure to bring enough for everybody, um, like a plant-based option. That's something I struggle with when I first became vegan, uh, plant-based and also still today. You mentioned that your family was a bunch of farmers. Did you have any difficulty with your family as far as when you changed to a plant-based diet? So not everyone in my family uh, was a farmer, but we do have farmers in my family, of course. Um, people also who had their own animals, 
And yeah, we, to this day, Fred, not, of course, not everyone in, in my, you know, immediate or extended family is plant-based. When you first discover this lifestyle, I am sure many people can relate, but when we first discover it, it's almost as if we want to scream it from the rooftops. We want to make sure that our loved ones know, you know, that, Mm -hmm. um, that, that, cause we care, genuinely care about them and friends. (laughs) <laughs> but if someone had told me back then, you know, I, I have, we've, we've uh, toned down quite a bit. Now we just bring our own food. We lead by example, because honestly, with friends and families, in my experience, it, it doesn't work so well. But I will say that three and a half years ago, so it's been 12 years for me, my husband transitioned uh, five years ago. Mm-hmm. So I lived with someone that long um, who wasn't vegan. And I actually did not force it on him as I don't know. I, I think I deserve an award personally, but, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it was, I remember and, and, you know, I'm glad it happened that year. Cause I don't know if I could have gone on one more year, yeah. but my, my father three years ago went vegan and he is, he is quite, uh, what do you, you know, ex- not extreme. I don't want to, it's, um, very, particular and and more than me he will definitely he's very ethical um and then my mother went plant-based as well nice. and yeah so it shows me that you know if we lead by example and do it healthy be the thriving example be beautiful and thriving and have amazing you know just just health right like just walk and talk what we what we uh, preach then i feel people in our life will change I read where you said veganism is a euphoric awakening and also daunting and lonely. Can you explain Mm. what you mean and give us some examples of why you feel this way? Oh, I I don't know where you read that, but I I (laughs) I have said that before. Um, It is such an awakening. For me, it literally felt like I was breaking free from a system that you know, a system of oppression. We are oppressing animals. We are also oppressing human beings by having them work in these horrible places. And furthermore, we're oppressing humans by taking, literally taking food away from, like we have enough grain and and corn and whatever, enough food to feed the entire world, yet we're putting it into animals' mouths uh, to feed us. Like it's completely unsustainable. And the animals are the middle people when we just go right to the, the plants. Um, so that is a liberating feeling breaking free from that. But at the same time, we are still a minority, right? We're not, I mean, it's not, it's a non, it's a non vegan world out there. Mm -hmm. And it's really, I know there are other justice issues that I've talked to people about. It's not just veganism. Um, uh, so many other things where it's like the elephant in the room. We see it, we know it. But for some reason, there's a huge disconnect and people still do it. You know, they're still, they don't want to hear because they know how, they know that um, they will feel so guilty and so bad about themselves. This is my theory. They don't want to hear it because they don't want to make these changes most of the time. But the, the other part of that, I know this from my nutrition training, is that these products are extremely addictive these, the, the, the dairy, the eggs and the, and the, and the meat, it's been documented mm-hmm. and it is literally like weaning ourselves off of it, like alcohol, like cigarettes. It's, it's a, it's a struggle. So we have all of that against us in a way. And so it's a very lonely place to be knowing this, but what we can uh, rejoice about and be happy with is the fact that many of us are uniting and we're finding our, our, um, groups and our people that think like us, that live like us. And also, um, you know, un- unification is key and, you know, we need, we need the, uh, I guess some people say, you know, why can't we just live, just be vegan, live it and not talk about it? That's a big thing in our vegan movement, isn't it? Mm. People say, you always mention you're vegan. It's not about that. You know, it's not like we don't have an agenda. It's just saying, look, you know, there is a compassionate way to live. And not just that, why would we do this to animals if we literally do not need one micro or macro nutrient from them? Nothing. There's nothing we cannot get from a plant. 
So why are we doing it? Do you feel that people are offended by, say, vegans, quote, preachy vegans, because they themselves have to take a look at their values and their ethics and their morals and decide that maybe they're not as good a person as they believe they might be? Yes, I do, actually. That's a great question, and I absolutely do. And I will say that that people do, they're inherently good. I mean, we are born as babies, usually, mm-hmm. <laughs> wanting to do good. And it feels good to do good. But when we have industries and huge corporations, and the majority is still this way, we look at that and we say, oh, you know, I mean, the marketing from the meat, dairy, and egg lobby is so uh, powerful. Mm -hmm. It's, it's still, you know, billions and billions of dollars going into convincing the public that this, this, you know, animal flesh is healthy and that it's necessary. And so, and they're paying for studies from, you know, all the time they're paying to, to have research done (laughs) right? and right. To prove their point. To prove their point. It's a big agenda yet. Yeah, yes, that people do get offended because they don't want to realize that, you know, that they're somehow bad people for doing this and change. It's I really feel that, you know, they hold off on realizing it like I did. Like I really didn't want to believe it a little bit because it's so uh, intense. Actually, once you really discover the truth, whether it's a small, medium or large scale farm, once you realize what is happening to the animal, there's like humane killing is a, is a myth, you know, Right. they have to, they have to like the, the cow actually has to eat. They have to bring some oats or their favorite treat and have it eat it. So, so it doesn't know what's coming up, you know, the knife is coming. And so, um, once we realize that it's really a lot to sit with, it's a lot like, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's heavy. Um, but I agree with you in your statement. I think that is, there's a lot of that, I think individual change is difficult. I really feel that on a systemic level, if we can, if we can uh, support the organizations uh, trying to affect systemic change, for example, subsidies, like we have so many hurdles. There's the addiction thing that I mentioned, you know, the it's addictive. And then we have governments spending our money on funding something like the dairy industry, funding the earth's destruction, funding, you know, deforestation indirectly, but very directly. Um, they're funding the dairy industry to keep it propped up, to keep it alive. Uh, when this is happening, it's a big hurdle. And so that's what I'm going to try to like focus on helping, not, you know, trying to support other organizations already doing this amazing work, um, by, by stopping that uh, change at that level. So we do have a couple of really, really great projects coming up and, And there's a lot of good people working on it. Now, how can businesses be more responsible? I do think it's businesses' responsibility. People do say, you know, it's our choice what we buy. We go into the grocery store. We vote with our dollars. That is very true. However, as a past and current business owner, it's a corporation and a business's responsibility to look at only offering ethical products no matter what. That is a, a huge thing as it's, it's more like, just, I'll give you an example. We had a company where we changed the packaging to hundred um, percent plastic free cardboard based, you know, biodegradable stuff. And mm-hmm. it was more expensive on the company, way more expensive because, um, because plastic is so cheap, <laughs> right. and, but you know, ethically speaking, it's what we had to do to set the standard. And I think companies, if they took responsibility and found a way, it is difficult for companies. I I recognize that. But in terms of not offering animal products, that's actually easy. It's really easy these days to just simply not, you know, to to not destroy our planet and not hurt an animal. But again, it comes back, back to knowledge. People don't know. It's really as much as we know, like we've been in this movement. I'm not sure how long you've been vegan, Fred. About 10 years now. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we've been in this a while and for us, we're in the bubble, I call it, you know, we're always around it. We're like, you know, um, the internet feeds us information and things like that. Whereas 
I have to keep reminding myself that not everyone is fed that info and there's a lot of people that don't know this yet. Now, we are the privileged few, the richer nations, and we have a responsibility to act accordingly. How can we change our habits so that we stop world hunger, stop the massive deforestation, and reduce the emissions? I think that's such an important point. So uh, this comes up a lot in conversation. I'm not sure if, if you hear this a lot, but in our, everything that we do now with our work, it's like, wow, like it's so privileged to be vegan or to, to, to try to force that on others. Actually, the opposite is true. Because we are, we have choices, we are privileged. Because of that, it is our responsibility to act and to choose the sustainable, the most sustainable things that we can. And unbelievable, like, like, uh, yeah, there's so much to say on this topic, but I do feel it's our responsibility to make these changes. Our, the nations you talk about, the most privileged nations in the world are responsible for, um, I, I would say all of the, the destruction on earth, you know, uh, corporations and of course, fossil fuels, but animal agriculture at the scale and, and grass fed too, um, has been proven to be the leading cause of uh, everything the climate is experiencing right now. And I want to just mention a white paper, a position paper by Dr. Silas Rao. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Rao wrote, wrote a white paper on animal agriculture and the environment. And it's amazing. It actually proves that all past numbers, even what the FAO put out and the pie charts, all those numbers have been grossly underestimated because of water consumption, um, you know, deforestation, like transportation of the animals that all should fall under animal agriculture. And it is, it's, it's a massive, uh, thing. So I don't want to quote the exact number, but it's over 80%, uh, is what animal agriculture contributes to the current emissions, you know, the current number of emissions. So, how do we change the disconnect that people have between the food they eat and the animals that are slaughtered? Yes, the disconnect. I'm not sure. Well, it's happened so that, so the way I went vegan was watching this documentary. That, that did it for me. And I do recognize that a lot of people will watch that. And I feel, you know, we try to analyze this in our think tanks, you know, in our, in our, in our um, brainstorming sessions. We're like, okay, like, you know, why does this person watch this and not make any changes at all and just keep living the way they're living? Mm -hmm. I, I do feel that it is so, it's like a real life horror show what's happening to the animals um, and humans. Mm -hmm. And so it's so unfathomable, the level of, of violence that people are so used to watching, you know, uh, fiction, uh, movies that really, it's like a, it's like a massive disconnect. They don't really believe it. Perhaps that, that came up and it made so much sense. Mm. And so it's like such a disconnect. They just can't believe we're capable of this. And then I actually worked um, I have a dear friend in Arkansas who is transitioning their farm right now and then to mushrooms. Um, and we, we have farms, uh, someone I'm talking to in, in England, there's farms all over the world right now who wake up one morning, the farmers, this is what happened to my friend. She woke up one morning and said, I cannot, um, I cannot break another chicken's neck. I cannot do this. You know, she had, I don't know, 20,000 chickens or mm -hmm. something. And then cows, and they 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 have like a, a an awakening almost, and it's almost like a rebirth. And they're like, I'm going vegan. And then because of the fact that they have to pay their bills, they keep doing the farming. And they're mm -hmm. living in depression. They're living in a total disconnect. They're like they're really really sad. Then um, finally, they realize they don't have to do this because we can transition with help, right? With funding, we can transition out of farming animals and into farming like hemp or peas or something that is cleaner, saves water, saves land and saves animals. And so, so I think at that level, again, I want to mention, like you said, you know, how do people, how do we get them to realize this? I do think it's going to take a bigger scale than just individual, you know, trying to change one person here and there at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and of course as many people as we can reach like like earthlings or a movie like um james wilkes did like the game changers right though those the game changers to date i don't know if you've looked at the data and what they have on their site um but it's it's one of the it's a piece of art like it, that that one documentary i think has made the most change to date i mean i don't know that's just me guessing but right many many people have switched over based on that documentary health wise and then earthlings and dominion which is also quite difficult to watch but it's you know you, you know what else i think on on the side i know i'm jumping around here but if we cannot bear to watch what's happening to our food should we be eating it right right so people want to know where their cucumber comes from they want to know if their carrots are local but they they don't want to bear to watch how their cow is murdered now how can we change the food system so that we can help farmers make the change should we create subsidies Yes, there's a lot of work happening in this movement. I'm not sure if you know about uh, Mercy for Animals, the farm transformation. Um, Mercy for Animals is currently transforming eight different farms. And it's going to take a few years, as you can imagine. Funding is changing. Like what's happening right now in Arkansas is they're changing um, the barns. You know, mm -hmm. they're taking the poultry barn. They're starting with one. And they're changing it literally from scratch into a mushroom farm. And then uh, I believe Craig, uh, a, few, uh, a few other farmers, like one in England right now is switching to mushrooms, I believe. And there's another one doing peas and location matters, what we can grow, but there's usually really controlled environments. Yes, if farms can transition globally, that would be huge. Because to be honest with you, in my experience, I've been talking to farmers for over three years now, three and a half years, not one of them will deny that. Like they'll say to the public, oh, like, you know, this is great work because it is farmers are the salt of the earth. Like mm -hmm. America, you know, the Amer there's nothing more wholesome than farmers feeding America or feeding the world or something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and we're not against farmers. This is not like a us like vegans against the farming community. It's us saying you they are also a victim of this horrible system exactly. because poultry farmers get pennies. For each chicken, literally, like 30 cents. It's like crazy. And Tyson is the winner, right? The big corporation. Mm -hmm. um, and so farmers are suffering. And if you talk to them 10 times out of 10, if you say, uh, would you like to transition to something that is cleaner, saves water, saves earth, less land, and you don't have to kill another animal, every one of them will say, tell me more. You know, And there's, it's more profitable, too, because the world is going that way. I think that one thing that's kind of underreported and in a way forgotten are the oppressed people that are working in these slaughterhouses. How can we help them? Yes. Well, getting rid of making sure that we transition out of farming animals, stopping the subsidies. There's rising nation rising in Canada and the fairness alliance, I believe is in the United States. Um, but Nation Rising is doing an incredible job trying to trying to petition and also uh, creating documents that people can give their MLAs and government and politics and politicians, showing them um, why we need to transition out of these subsidies. So that that's going to be the only way, in my opinion, in my experience, to help people working in these horrible conditions. So the statistics are mind blowing. Like the amount of um, PTSD coming out of factory farm workers, you know, when, when um, they have trauma from killing animals all day. Mm -hmm. And also, I remember reading this and I have not saved the actual literature, but I remember reading about um, the violence and the crime rate around areas where there are factory farms, mm -hmm. uh, domestic violence included, because a person's mind cannot be doing this all day and stay healthy. And it's a big issue. So that's one issue. 
and they're not paid well. I know in the United States they 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 bring up people from from Mexico and and all of these other countries to pay them pennies so they can make a bigger bigger profit. So they're making profit off the backs of these humans and off the backs of the animals, literally. Um, it's a really disgusting industry. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned earlier that you have children. Mm -hmm. What do you tell them and how do you teach them about veganism? From day one, I've always sworn to that. I told them, I vowed to them that I'm going to tell them the truth no matter what. So if they ask me a question, they're going to get the truth, including Santa Claus. I was about to say, like, what about yeah, Santa yeah. Claus? <laughs> oh, they know from, we have the magic at home. This is a different topic. We definitely have the magic of, of the holidays and all that, but but we, uh, and we have fairies, we build fairy homes in the summer, like we, you know, celebrate mm -hmm. solstice, but they do know that there's no real man in the white, you know, uh, sorry for anyone listening, by the way, who mm. may, you know, um, believe in this and that's amazing, but, um, they, they don't think there's a, a man who comes into their home and delivers gifts at the same time. They also know the truth about like, if they want ice cream, for example, because ice cream is like something that is so disconnected. It's like a beautiful treat. It's, you know, something families do on, on, on the weekend, they go get ice cream. And mm -hmm. so if that's happening and they want ice cream and I say, you know what, like I, I give them full autonomy from day one. I'm really glad I had certain people in my life parenting wise that I read so many things about giving our children, trusting them, giving them autonomy, trusting their decisions no matter what, with the vegan thing or anything else. And it's worked in our family and most of the families that we communicate with right now. It's worked so beautifully. They ask, like, I, you know, we're there. I choose myself, the vegan option. If they don't have a vegan cone, I get a dish, like a, a, a you know, bowl. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's me and my husband does the same thing. And then we let them order like they're, my oldest is 10 now. He does his own, like he talks and he does his own ordering. And every single time, like it just gives me such pride because, you know, they know that, I mean, deep down, they probably know mommy's going to be disappointed if they have the dairy for mm -hmm. sure, <laughs> but, but they don't want to hurt baby cows because of all the videos that I've showed them. And I don't, I have not showed them uh, dominion or earthlings yet mm -hmm. because I don't want to traumatize them at such a young, young age. And not that I know some families disagree with me. I've talked to them about, you know, they have to know the truth, but I also feel like I don't want to depress the children. Like I want them to have a childhood and play and like not worry about the, all the world's problems. So there are amazing resources that are age appropriate, like um, Bite Size Vegan is one of them. I don't know if you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Bite Size Vegan, her name is Emily. You should see her videos. They're just unbelievably cute and beautiful. And the children love her videos and how to talk to kids about veganism. That's one of her videos. And so it's great stuff. And then my partner, my friend Amy, Jean and I are starting something really amazing for parents that are, that's similar because... It's, it's a very uh, tricky topic for a lot of parents. So if I went off on a tangent, you can bring me back there, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, yeah. No, yeah. I got I, one thing. I lost I'm, the original question. <laughs> <laughs> it was just basically about your children and uh, how you help them with veganism. Now, we were just talking about age appropriate. Do you feel it would be beneficial if we showed documentaries such as Earthling to high school students? Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. I have seen worse in high school. I mean, we've all, I mean, I don't know about you, but I saw horror movies when I was in high school. Now like, I watched I like watch a driver's it. ed movie that gave me nightmares. Okay. Yeah. So similar, like I used to see Stephen King movies, things like this. So this is reality. And I do think that that is a good age. Uh, you know, as a past teacher, I can remember thinking the, if you think age, but again, you know, every kid um, matures differently. And I think it's a parent's responsibility to kind of feel that out and say, Hey, can my child handle this? And I do know parents who have shown these things to their children at a very, very young age. I mean, I'm not sure if you know the Phoenix family, like Joaquin Phoenix's family, Mm -hmm. Um, so heart Phoenix, uh, has become a dear friend of mine because through my, my, my summit and my work. And so she's took the approach, a beautiful approach actually 
never lying to her children, same thing. They can handle more than we think. And I think it might be the reason why her son at three years old was on a fishing boat and said, oh my God, like, is this where my fish come from? You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so he was three. And see, I think too, I don't hide their eyes or anything. I just haven't exposed them to it. But with anything, if we're like, if a parent's emotions, position, vibe, you know, is like, oh my God, don't watch, it's scary. They're going to think it's scary. But if it's just like, oh, here's something we're watching and this is reality, then the child doesn't necessarily get scared or traumatized. So I think really, I really think every parent, it's just something nice that they can think about and feel where their child's at. And I don't think there's a right or wrong way, but I do think the truth is so important for children because they're born compassionate. They're born not wanting to eat animals at all. It's something we force on them. Mm -hmm. Whereas my doctor or like past midwives or people have said to me, why are you forcing veganism on your children when the opposite is actually true? We are not forcing veganism. We're letting them birth naturally, birth into a world where compassion rules and also we are plant eating hominids, you know, like mm -hmm. Dr. Clapper says, we actually, you know, we're primates, like we're really made and designed to eat plants. And so that is our birthright. And if they want to choose to eat an animal later on, that's on them, you know, but, um, but the force, we do force our children collectively to consume animals. I feel very strongly about that. What is one thing that's really exciting you right now in your life? So, there's so many right now, Fred, that's happening. It's kind of open. Since I actually paused the company, my last company, because of COVID, I stopped what I was doing. Uh, so I've closed companies, sold companies, and now paused a company. And it's opened up so many doors um, for beautiful things. And what excites me the most about what I'm actually doing is that I'm finally... I'm finally aligning my work with my values as well. So I'm finally combining my work with my activism, mm. um, which I feel very privileged to be able to do. Not everybody could do that, but I decided you know, a couple of years ago that I no longer wanted to do anything that wasn't making an impact, that wasn't doing anything for the greater good. Um, and so now my aim is to create just create, you know, we talk a lot about destruction and, and changing the system. And so, but if we're creating these great alternatives, a resource for parents or something very special, then, um, you know, university students, we're, we're helping universities change their cafeterias to plant-based only. That to me is a, is a, is a very exciting place to be. I noticed that you're involved with something called Plant Futures Initiative, can you tell me about this and how did you get involved with Plant Futures Initiative? Of course, yes. Uh, I do a bit of uh, uh, guest lecturing at the university level. So a uh, university called St. Thomas here in our town in Eastern Canada and also um, at Harvard. We, I met um, Samantha, the founder of Plant Futures, through uh, the professor at the class that I that I love so much and, and guest lecture for. And she started Plant Futures basically to fill a need at Berkeley. So she's a, a Berkeley grad, started there. And really what it is, is they're just working to accelerate the transition to a plant-centric food system. Mm -hmm. And as you know from my previous comments, this is something really, really that I, I just love and want to be involved with more. And I think all of us should look at kind of helping at that level, the food system level, because we only have precious time right now on the earth. And basically it ensures that students become leaders, like ethical leaders, mm -hmm. thinkers, advocates, plant centric future, like all of the things that are amazing. It, it's a basically acts plant futures initiative work acts as a bridge between students and uh, corporations and they have challenge labs uh, based like doing uh, they help students find internships with with uh, companies. I think it's such a great initiative. And it's they have a chapter. They have many chapters, um, various universities. You can go right onto their site, planfuturesinitiative.org, and then look at like there's a chapter at Berkeley at Yale. Uh, I'm involved with with the Plan Futures as a whole, but also specifically working with the students at Harvard 
who are completely blowing my mind. They're just so amazing. They work, they work throughout their summer Mm -hmm. um, extra time on helping with this movement. You said that it's a bridge between the corporations and the school. How does it work? Yeah. So they offer, there's a course, actually the Plan Futures Challenge Lab is a course offered for academic credit by UC Berkeley um, School of Business and um, also School of Public Health. And the Challenge Lab trains these students to be, un, you know, ethical, think to the future. Um, ha- instead of working for something that perhaps isn't making such a big difference, they're challenging them to find something that is making a massive impact. Com- really great companies like Meaty, Amy's, um, and that's how it works. So just training the future of humanity, basically. Um, and you can read about it again on the website uh, and just go to Challenge Lab. There's a lot of information there. What we're most excited about, some of the chapters, some of the students are really taking initiative. And for example, one of the projects, so we have a we have an incredible video project coming out. It's a video montage of so many incredible voices. Um, anyone from the Esselsteins, Dr. Esselstein, Dr. Clapper, even voices from the community, um, it's directly going to be sent directly to the White House. Mm-hmm. Uh, be, it's be right before their conference on hunger, nutrition, and health. They have an upcoming conference, uh, and it's the first time in 50 years the White House has ever done anything like this, opened up this conversation. So we really prioritized this project. We could not, uh, you know, not do it. <laughs> we, mm-hmm. we put everything else on hold and decided to do this. So we're in the, we're in the middle of getting all these recordings now from these incredible people. And, um, and then we're going to just launch that. And then in the fall, we're planning a panel discussion with these experts as well, challenging Harvard first to go completely vegan because they claim to want sustainability and better for the earth. And they have courses coming out and so on. And so how can we be serving meat, dairy or eggs in the food halls when this you know it goes against everything they believe? So I think that's going to be a success. And once that happens, Our hope is that other universities will follow suit and also change their dining halls. That's a great idea. So a lot of times it's putting your money where your mouth is, right? So Mm -hmm. you have Harvard saying, oh, we're for sustainability. There's a lot of that going around these days with corporations and corporate speak. But now you're actually making them put their money where their mouth is. Exactly. Exactly. And... Um, recently, uh, there was a student led initiative to help the university divest from fossil fuels and it was a success. So they, they agreed to do that. And so student led activism really works at these universities because the students are like the bread and butter of the university. They are the, they are the university. And when families back these initiatives, that's the approach we plan to take. And of course, starting with any university is amazing. But when you have a university like Harvard, one of the best funded uh, campuses around, uh, it, it, it does hold a lot of um, weight when you mention that. So, so we want to start there and then move on. And then there's other plans as well. It's not just at, at that level, but we want to really um, showcase that a plant-based diet is, is in, we need to transition to that. Um, and offering students uh, meat, dairy, and eggs is not good for their mental health either or their ability to focus. And we have the research backing it. It's always evidence-based. What is one habit or hack or tip or another way that helps you stay on track with your plant-based diet? Uh, the animals. It always comes back to thinking there is a victim involved. And another thing, Fred, is we there is, to this day, not one person has been able to show me the literature on what we need from an animal. Every micro and macro nutrient can be found in a plant. So we go to the source. What is it about animals that makes you so passionate? To me, the word uh, speciesism comes to mind because when, let's say that you see a dog in the street being kicked or a child being hurt, 
would you turn around and, and like turn a blind eye? That's the same for me. There is no difference between, you know, of course there's a difference between my child and a cow. People ask me this all the time, but you know, for me personally, but I'm talking about in the grand scheme of things, mm-hmm. how the world works. We are not part of the food chain. You know, we are part of an ecosystem and we are, we're not designed to kill the animals. And so the animals to me, it's like, it's like hurting our own species and a cow feels pain, a lobster feels pain, a crab feels pain, and so do fish, by the way. Just because they can't show it or speak, that doesn't mean they, they're not sentient. And that is what it is. It's how could we do harm when we don't need to do it, right? To, to Like, we love our pets. Would we ever l- watch a cat being tortured? I don't think so. That is what it is, I think. It's, it's that simple. What cookbook, book, or documentary have you gifted or recommended most to someone transitioning to a plant-based diet? The most I, I love Oshi Glows still. I always refer that one. And I'm really excited to receive one from um, Jane and Anne Esselstyn, actually. They, they have a new book out. With a, mm. just, it's supposed to be for women. And I can't wait to get that book, actually. Um, There's so many. I say Oshi Glows because it's easy ingredients. It, they're accessible. You know, they're not, they're not anything we don't recognize. And so people really appreciate that. Yeah, I would say that one. I just made the uh, chocolate zucchini muffins the other day. <laughs> yeah, delicious. <laughs> yeah, they are. They're really good. And um, easy. <laughs> they are. They're, they're very yeah. easy to make. Exactly. Finally, can you give me one word to describe how you felt before you became vegan and one word to describe how you feel now that you are vegan? Yeah, you have so many great questions. Um, now, well, before I went vegan, I didn't know, right. I didn't like, you know, you only really feel or know something after the fact hindsight, I guess is 2020, but I felt, okay. So are you talking about physically or like sort of like a feeling? Either one. Emotionally. I mean, looking back now, emotionally, I did feel like trapped or like it wasn't in alignment with any of my values or morals. And today I feel liberated. It's euphoric, as I said. Um, and physically, yeah, I feel, I felt, you know, heavy drained. I was getting all this, like, I mean, animal protein is terrible for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and now I feel lighter and cleaner and just, um, all around happier. You know, it's a really great place to be. It's such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. What is the best way for people to follow you on Instagram, the web and social media in general? Yeah. So, um, of course you can link my site, but, um, I'm working on something called rising mothers right now. It's rising dash mothers.com. That's the best place to find me right now. Thanks again, Margo, for being on plant your seed. Thank you so much for everything you do, Fred. I appreciate it. Hope you are inspired by this story. And remember, it's never too late to plant your seed. Links to everything we talked about on the podcast can be found on Instagram at plant.yourseed in the show notes tab in the bio. If you enjoyed the show, remember to leave us a review. And until next time, thank you for listening.